1943, two years of the most devastating war had gone. Defeats suffered in 1941 and retreats made in 1942 were left in the past for the Red Army soldiers. It was time to scour the invaders from their land. Millions of men and women had to leave their families and jobs to master new professions. Former workers, engineers, teachers, and students became tankers, scouts, infantrymen, pilots, artillerists, and submariners. They learned how to fight professionally, how to survive, and how to win. We're going to tell you about those who won this war, who liberated towns and villages, our land, our motherland, our people. Here is our story about the Liberators. Summer was extremely dry and soggy. Houses that survived by miracle were scattered here and there in the fields. Drone and rumble, clattering tracks and roaring motors. Tanks moved forward through dust and smoke. New and freshly painted tanks were headed by 20-year-old guys. In a few days, they were to become the heroes of one of the main battles of the Great Patriotic War, the Battle of Kursk. July 1943, the Liberators were approaching the Kursk salients. Alexander Burstev, Grigory Shishkin, Alexander Bandar, and others in the Tankers of the Liberators series. The popularity of tankers before the war was comparable to one of fighter pilots only. In addition to high salaries and complete allowance packages, tankers had iron-gray uniforms, leather jackets, and tank helmets. Soviet tank commanders were trained for two years. They studied different field tanks operated by the Red Army. Commanders were trained to drive tanks, to fire guns and machine guns. They also studied tank battle tactics. Battle tank commanders were able to substitute any crew member. The war turned out to be a far more severe test for tankers and tanks than expected. By 1 June 1941, Germany had 5,639 tanks and self-propelled guns. By the first day of the war, two-thirds of those vehicles were concentrated by the Germans at the border, ready to attack the Soviet Union. Mikhail Katukov, Marshal of the Armored Troops, wrote, In addition to German vehicles, there were Czech Skodas, French Schneider, Renault, and even English small tanks captured in Poland. I realized that the whole industrially developed Europe worked for Hitler. The German armed forces had four tank groups making the basis of the German assault units. Their mission was to clear the road for the infantry aggressively rushing forward, cracking defense and quickly reaching the major targets of the operation. They were not used to keep a specific territory. The main purpose was an onslaught forward to the back land in order to disrupt resistance and disorganize the enemy. The tank groups were equipped with field and air defense artillery, motorcycle units, and different vehicles. Moreover, each group was supported by an air corps. The German tank spearheads were opposed by the Soviet tank armies equipped with BT-7 and T-26 light tanks. Soviet tank forces were upgraded and reinforced. New T-34s and KBs that surpassed their German rivals had just arrived to field units. Therefore, crew members did not have enough time to master advanced vehicles. As a result, new tanks may be left behind on the road because of minor failures. The loss was quite significant. 
By late autumn 1941, 20,000 out of 30,000 tanks operated by the Red Army were lost, and the majority of them were simply left by their crews because of failure, lack of fuel, or ammunition. Most tankers changed their uniform for infantry shirts, leaving tank helmets only. However, they still remained tankers. By late December 1942, when the industrial facilities evacuated to the Urals managed to reach pre-war tank output level, Stalin ordered to immediately transfer all tankers from the other combat arms to the armored command of the Red Army. Stalin's order was ended with the following phrase. I prohibit herewith to employ tankers of all categories mentioned above otherwise than in accordance with their intended appointment. The Soviet command had already attempted to form large tank units. However, the shortage of well-thought structure and skilled commanders who were able to manage all inventory available led to extensive losses. German General von Millington wrote, and We believed that the Russians made a tool that they were never going to master. However, in winter 42 and 43, the signs of tactics improvement became evident. By 1943, the Soviet command learned many lessons. The USSR Army started forming tank forces, taking into account mistakes and errors made in the past. The forthcoming battle was to test the appropriateness of this decision. Following the German disastrous defeat at Stalingrad, the Red Army launched the offensive that lasted till March 1943, when it was stopped by the Wehrmacht counterstrike in the eastern Ukraine. The Kursk salient occupied by the Soviet forces extended westward in the center of the Soviet German front. The German commanders kept the strategic initiative. In other words, the possibility to choose time and direction of attack. The Soviet commanders had to anticipate the enemy's actions. The Red Army Command followed the information provided by the front intelligence units. The data on any movements of the German troops were constantly reported to the Stavka. By 8 April, Zhukov managed to foresee the offensive force and the likely site of the attack targeted at the Kursk salient. The German offensive was known as Operation Citadel. The Germans' goal during Citadel was to make two concurrent strikes. Model's troops would attack southward from Orel, while Manstein's units would attack northward from Belgorod. Their mission was to encircle and destroy a large Soviet army group. Zhukov understood that the efficiency of defense of the Kursk salient greatly depends on the Soviet tank armies. Disastrous defeats during 1941 resulted in the loss of almost all tanks deployed in the western regions and, which is even more important, most professional tankers. The shortage of skilled tankers became evident in summer of 1942. In order to officer new tank forces, Stalin ordered to send monthly at least 5,000 privates and sergeants who completed at least seven years of studies at school. 8,000 soldiers that completed at least three years at school were withdrawn from the front to the training tank regiments monthly. They became gunners, drivers, and loaders. In addition to frontline soldiers, school graduates, tractor drivers, and combiners were sent to training centers. The training course was reduced from two years to six months to cut the syllabus to the minimum. Still having no time, they had to study 12 hours a day. Grigory Shishkin recollects, those who had satisfactory marks obtained a junior lieutenant rank. One guy became junior lieutenant because of his disrespectful attitude to the vehicles. The exam was held on a very cold day. The guy was asked where the sprocket wheel was. He gave a kick on the wheel and obtained a lower rank. Vasily Bryukov recollects. In his farewell speech, the head of the training school said, well, guys, we understand that you've almost skipped the training. You have no proper skills. However, you will get them in action. Newly 
baked lieutenants were sent to tank plants in Gorky, Nizhny, Tagil, Chelyabinsk, and Omsk. One T-34 tank battalion rolled off the assembly line daily. The graduate commander received a special tank log to fix all events in the course of the tank's operations. He was also given a pen knife and a watch to be mounted on the control board. However, tankers used to keep the watch because very few people could boast about having their own wrist watch or pocket watch. Sometimes tankers were given silk scarves to be used as fuel filters. However, over time they were not required anymore. Tanks and fuel pumps were equipped with high quality filters. Commanders met their crews at the plant. Altogether, they made a crew of four. Usually tank commanders held lieutenant or junior lieutenant ranks. Loaders were the second ranked crew members, normally master sergeants. Drivers were sergeants or major sergeants. Radio gunners held the rank of at least first class privates. Having received their tanks at the plant, the crews started their 50-kilometer route march that ended with combat firing. Then tanks were loaded on platforms and forwarded to the west, to the front line to meet their fate. By summer 1943, both the structure and the ammunition of tank forces changed. T-34 had become the main battle tank, gradually substituting obsolete T-26s and BTs. It was a movable and fast battle tank fitted with well-tested, reliable diesel motor and inclined armor. T-34 tank, a legendary battle tank of the Great Patriotic War, was designed by the team of engineers headed by Mikhail Ilik Kashkin. The tests of two first pilot tanks started as early as 10 February 1940. On 17 March, T-34 was delivered to the Kremlin, together with other vehicles, where they were demonstrated to Stalin and the Soviet government. Lieutenant Alexander Burtsev, tank commander, recollects. Inclined armor made tankers feel especially proud. T-34 armor is thinner than Panthers and Tigers. The overall thickness is about 45 millimeters. However, Due to its inclined position, the hypotenuse reached approximately 90 millimeters, preventing the penetration. T-34s sent to the Kursk salient were equipped with a long-barreled 76 millimeter gun. Its armor-piercing shell was able to penetrate 7 millimeter armor from the distance of one kilometer. The Germans were also preparing for the Battle of Kursk. Their engineers designed new tanks, a famous German tank Zoo, T-5 Panther and T-6 Tiger. Tiger Heavy Tank was undoubtedly one of the best tanks of the Second World War. However, new machinery put into service caused the same trouble for the Germans like the Red Army tankers experienced in 1941. The main problem of Tigers was quick failure during route marches. Vehicles had to cover large distances in the Eastern Front, while the repair of new machinery required skilled personnel and spare parts. Often, they experienced the shortage of both as well as fuel required by Tigers in large quantities. As a result, German crews, like Soviet ones, left their tanks on the roads. In addition to new tanks, old T3s and T4s were upgraded and reinforced. Upgraded T3s penetrated T-34 front armor from the distance of 500 meters while side armor was punched through from 900 meters. Upgraded T-4 with reinforced armor and advanced gun surpassed 1941-43 model of T-34 equipped with 76 millimeter gun. A 
face-to-face -face combat between T-34 and Panther or Tiger in open terrain were mere suicide for Soviet tanks. Both Panthers and Tigers were able to hit T-34 front armor from over two kilometers. The T-34's gun was able to penetrate Panther's side armor only from 1,300 meters, while the penetration distance for Tigers was 500 meters. In 1943, Soviet tankers could manage to hit Panther's front armor in close combat only. The combat speed was 20 to 30 kilometers per hour. Therefore, at the Kursk salient, the Soviet tanks were opposing the enemy's tanks that were able to destroy them several times before they reached their effective range. T-34-85, fitted with an 85mm gun, appeared no sooner than in 1944. This tank became a victory symbol of the Red Army because it was able to sustain the German zoo. In summer 1943, all expectations were connected with this vehicle. The 3476 was an advanced battle tank. As any traditional model, it combined both recent technical solutions and compromised designed concepts. The first tanks were equipped with outdated gearboxes that could be operated by skilled drivers only. Lieutenant Alexander Bandar, platoon commander, recollects. Unskilled driver may activate the fourth speed instead of the first because they have the same direction on the handle or the third instead of the second. It may lead to the gearbox failure. Drivers should be able to change gears automatically, even with closed eyes. It was almost impossible to change gears by hand. Drivers used their knees or were assisted by gunners sitting aside. Horrible noise inside the tank made the communication devices and the radio station unworkable. Therefore, to communicate with the driver, the commander put his legs on the driver's shoulders, press the shoulders to turn, slightly knock on the head to move forward, and push in the back to stop the vehicle. The German tank took a crew of five, including three crew members located in the turret. T-34 had set for four, while the turret had a place for two persons only. Therefore, tank commanders acted as commanders and as sight gunners. The commander was separated from the loader by the gun. They were able to communicate, but mostly speaking in signs. Alexander Bandar recollects. Show your fist to the loader to make him charge an armor-piercing shell, while a flat hand means a fragmentation shell. After shooting, the turret was filled with powder gases, irritating the eyes. The fan mounted in the turret was not capable of blowing the smoke away. Fired cartridges also emitted smoke. Often, the loader had to throw hot cartridges from the tank by hand. T-34s were minimally comfortable. During offensive actions, tankers had to sleep in the tanks in a semi-sitting position. Petri Kirichenko, Major Sergeant, Radio Gunner. Though I was tall and thin, I managed to find a position to have a sleep sitting on my seat. Recline the backrest, take off your felt boots to keep your feet warm and enjoy sleeping. Nikolai Alexandrov recollects. During the war, I never slept in a normal bed, either on a plank bed or on boards. The driver and the radio operator slept semi-sitting on their seats while we laid on the ammunition stowage rack. Sometimes we put boards on the turret rank to have a short sleep. If a tank unit took up defensive or laying in wait positions, special earth shelters, caponieres were made, winter, snow, frozen earth, and four shovels. Grigory Shishkin recollects. Just try to dig out a trench three meters wide, six meters long, and approximately two meters deep. Sometimes, after the tank was finally hidden in such shelter, we received an order to march. So we changed the position and started digging again. 
In winters, tanks became real cold boxes. Then the crew dug out a trench and put the tank above. A special tank wood fire oven was mounted under the hull floor. The oven heated oil in the motor. Therefore, it was easy to fire up the tank if necessary. The oven also heated the crew. The tankers gathered around the oven to warm up. Here, they slept. The bottom of the trench was covered by brush, wood, and greatcoats. Canvas cloth was used to cover open areas. Such dugout shelters was not quite comfortable. However, it was much warmer there than in the tank or outside. The Battle of Kursk was inexorably approaching. The unprecedented number of armored vehicles never yet seen during the war stop in tracks on the alert. The final plan of the Soviet command was as follows. To make the enemy exhaust himself against the defenses and to go over to the general offensive, which would finally finish off his main force. The following newly formed armies were assigned to the counter-offensive actions against the exhausted enemy. Katukov's 1st Tank Army, Rodin's 2nd Tank Army, and Rotmistrov's 5th Guard Tank Army. Staying on the defensive, or during remarshalling, tankers brushed up their vehicles first, and only then themselves. The crew members, irrespective of their ranks, filled the tank with fuel, cleaned the gun, checked the sight and all working parts of the tank. Only after the tank was in perfect order, the tankers could have a wash, have a shave, take a meal, and, which is more important, take a rest. The tank was the tanker's home. They were used to severe conditions. During offensive operations, they were not able to wash or change clothes. Grigory Shishkin recollects. We happened to stay a whole month without washing. We were happy to have a wash once in 10 days. The washing house was arranged as follows. A hovel covered with fir tree branches was made in the forest. The floor was also covered with fir tree branches. Several crews gathered together to have a wash. One is responsible for heating, others for fire, wood, and water. During intensive fighting, food was delivered to tankers by the end of the day only. They had their breakfast and lunch and dinner at the same time. Officers had supplementary ration, including butter, sugar, and sweets. However, it was mauvais ton to have meals alone. Therefore, commanders shared their supplementary ration with their crew. Food reserves were kept in the tank. During offensive operations, such reserves were the only source of food for the crew. Mikhail Schuster recollects. Tankers enjoyed good food supplies. We also used captured food as supplementary rations. The bag ration was fully consumed before battling in order not to waste food if we were going to be burnt. Once, the unit of Burstev's tank captured a German food convoy. Sausage, cans, cheese. We filled our tanks with food, and a week was not enough to do away with it. Veterans told about food provided by civilians. We did drink alcohol. After battle, we took our ration, 100 grams. However, a skilled commander would never let the crew take any alcohol before battling. Grigory Shishkin recollects. All people around were drinking. Field engineers teased us. You iron pigs, why aren't you offered a drink? First, my guys took offense. Then they understood that was for their sake. Drink as much as you want after fighting and never before, because each minute, each second matters. If you miss your chance, you are lost. Have a rest after battling and back in action. Skilled frontline soldiers shared their experience with newcomers. First, unlock the hatch to be able to open it. If necessary, pushing with the head. Second, clean the socket of the intercommunications system to pull out the plug easily when leaving the smoking tank. Third, take off the belt. Cut off pockets from the jacket in order not to be hooked when jumping out. Such invaluable advice saved many lives. Different things could become obstacles on the way from a burning vehicle even uncomfortable clothes. 
Konstantin Schitz recollects. One tank squadron was commanded by Senior Lieutenant Sirik, quite a presentable man. Once, he captured some good clothes at the station and he started wearing a long Romanian coat. When their tank was shot, the crew managed to jump out while the commander did not because of the coat. Moreover, drivers adjusted overspeed choppers to increase the power. It was prohibited because such adjustment reduced the service life of engines. However, increased power was an extra advantage that became determinative during battle. Last minutes before fighting were spent in private. The information on the exact time of the offensive was received in the night of 5 July from the captives. The commanders of the Central and Voronezh fronts decided to arrange an immediate artillery counteroffensive support. Concurrently, aircrafts attacked airdromes. However, the concentrated fire of the Soviet artillery was sufficiently effective only in the areas where the Soviet intelligence units managed to identify deployed enemy's facilities. While the morning attacks of the Soviet air forces failed because the Luftwaffe aircrafts had already been in the air. The Germans launched their offensive in the morning of 5 July. Operation Citadel started with a traditional Blitzkrieg preparation fire and howling dive bombers. Vasily Krysov, commander of self-propelled gun, recollects. No sooner had the last enemy bombs exploded that dive bombers suddenly appeared all over. Groups of 20 to 30 aircrafts crossed the front line and discharged their deadly cargo. Bombs were howling down, rocketing the earth, turning it inside out, destroying fighting holes, pits, communication trenches, and dugout shelters. The Soviet command had at their disposal significantly more manpower and weapons. However, the reserves were scattered along 100 kilometers of the front line. While the Germans managed to concentrate their forces on the main direction of the offensive, four to five times exceeding the power of the defensive lines, Wehrmacht managed to gain sevenfold superiority in the number of tanks on the southern flank. Andrei Yulinov, artillerist, recollects. Tanks were spread before the eyes. They seemed to be everywhere along the horizon line. They seemed not to be moving. That July morning was sunny. The steppe was covered in heat haze. Tigers and panthers were floating in the haze. We definitely saw barrels and antennas. The whole armada was creeping up on us. We did not count them. It was useless. The enemy was breaking through the Soviet defense. It took the second tank SS Corps commanded by Paul Hauser 17 hours only to overcome the front defense line that had been built for several months. In order to stop the German units, the armored reserves was engaged on the second day of the battle. The Soviet counter-strikes did not change the situation on the battlefield. However, Wehrmacht divisions were in the position of a bear surrounded by hunting dogs. The German units had to dissipate their forces and occupy defensive positions. Instead of Blitzkrieg, the Germans were drawn into an exhaustive war. Most dramatic events happened on the southern flank. Hoth's 4th Panzer Army meant to advance on Oboyan, but failed. On 
On 9 June, the Germans changed the main offensive direction to Prokhorovka. The Soviet commanders readied their units for an assault on the German divisions. The 5th Guards Tank Army, commanded by Lieutenant General Pavel A. Rotmistrov, was sent from the steppe front to Prokhorovka. The commitment of Rotmistrov's army was to cut the main tank group, Hoth's army, Hauser's 2nd Tank SS Corps. On 12 July at 8.30, guardsmen launched their attacks in response to Katyusha firing signal. The main assault was targeted at the 6-kilometer front line, 2 kilometers southwest of Prokhorovka. Just at that spot took place a famous battle that was subsequently called the Tank Encounter Battle. However, no encounter battle happened. The reconnaissance data enabled the German command to anticipate the Soviet counterstrike. Only one, Hauser's division that was not opposed by the Soviet armed forces managed to launch an offensive, while two other divisions took their defensive positions preparing to fire at Russian tanks from a distance. An attack command was heard through helmet headphones. The commander slightly pushed the driver's head forward. The vehicle rushed forward, roaring, clattering, and leaving a dust cloud behind. The visibility through the hatch palm wide open was approximately 100 to 150 meters. The lives of the crew members depended on the driver's experience. He had to assess the position, determine the route, find an appropriate shelter, and protect the tank sides. The radio operator was tuned to receiving. It was possible to switch to the internal communication system if necessary. The radio operator was also responsible for firing the machine gun, aiming through a finger-wide hole with land and sky flitting before his eyes. The loader observed the right-hand area. His task was to load the gun and to point out potential targets to the commander. The commander watched left and right, seeking for targets. Due to squeezing space, he would hold his hands crosswise. His left hand was on the lifting mechanism, while his right hand on the turret turning handle. No time for fear. Fear was fading away by cold-blooded premeditation. Nikolai Zhilezhnov recollects. You were driven by an intangible extra force in an attack. You were not a human being capable of thinking. Maybe this was the way to survive. Tanks were zigzag moving forward at 20 to 30 kilometers per hour. The commander caught an enemy tank by the sight, pushed the driver's head and shouted, short, meaning a short stop. Command to the loader, armor piercing. If the driver saw a level area in front of the tank, he shouted to the commander, pathway. It meant that the commander could stop the tank and start firing if necessary. The loader rammed a shell and attempted to outcry the motor roar and clashing bold. Armor piercing ready, suddenly stopping. The tank keeps vibrating. Countdown, one. Now all depends on the commander, his skills and luckiness. A motionless tank is an easy target for the enemy. Sweat dripped into your eyes. The right hand turned the turret. The laying mark was pointed at the target. Two, the left hand rotated the lifting mechanism to adjust the range. Three, fire. The commander pushed the gun's bolt. The rival managed to shoot back, but it was a bound shot. The shell bounced off the armor. The blow on the tank would make your ears ring. Scale splitting off the armor would cut your face and penetrate into your mouth. Without waiting for a command, the driver took off the tank. The battle proceeded. The Soviet tanks continued front assault in the open area, while the German Tigers and T-4s fired at the Soviet vehicles, before the same managed to approach the same within the shooting distance. Vasily Bryukov recollects. The distance between tanks was no more than 100 meters. No maneuvering was possible. It was not a war, it was a mere beating. We were crawling, firing. Unbearable stench hanged over the battlefield. Everything was covered by smoke, dust, fire.
Tanks were burning, vehicles were burning, communication systems failed. On 12 July, Rotmistrov's army suffered serious losses. The counterattack failed and never changed over to the counteroffensive. However, Manstein's plans to break through the Prokhorovka defensive lines came to nowhere. Losses could have been more significant if General Mikhail E. Katukov's 1st Tank Army had not managed to destroy Hoth's flank. This assault made the Germans get back to Obayan positions, some artillery units, and other resources primarily intended to be sent to Prokhorovka. During one fighting week, the German tanks advanced 35 kilometers forward to the southern flank, where they had to stop. As early as 12 July, the Germans took on the defensive on the northern flank of the Kursk salient. You never know whether the battle is going to be successful for you or not. If a shell hits the motor compartment, you're lucky because the tank dies out and the crew has time to jump out. If a shell hits the turret or the fighting compartments, fragments would wound crew members. Split fuel inflamed easily. The only thing that mattered is the tanker's ability to quickly respond because he has two or three seconds to leave the tank before the fire runs through the fighting compartments. Alexander Faden recollects. Most guys were brave soldiers. Slow soldiers died quickly as a rule. You should be quick to survive. It was far more horrible to remain in the motionless but still not burning tank. Ian Degen recollects. No order was required to leave a burning tank. The more, especially as the commander might have been killed. However, the crew could not leave the tank with a broken track. The crew should continue firing, staying still, unless it started burning. On 13 July, Hitler stopped Operation Citadel. Wehrmacht had to send their forces to other fronts. The Soviet tank armored units needed rest and reinforcement. Survived tankers who lost their tanks were put into the battalion reserve. Nobody took a long rest. Unburnt tanks were quickly repaired. Sometimes one tank was made using the spare parts from several shot up vehicles. Often repair required rather inventive skills than efforts. Ivan Nikonov recollects. My tank fell down from the bridge. We managed to hook it, but could not pull it out. Our experts dug out a shallow trench and put one track inside. Then the other tank was positioned perpendicularly. The track was disconnected from the second tank while the rope was connected to the sprocket wheel. Such hoist was used to pull the tank out. Then the tracks were mounted back and the tank was fired. New tanks arrived continuously from the plants. In two to three days, tankers received newly crewed vehicles and back in action again. Ian Degen recollects, tracks in blood is rather a metaphor. Tracks were covered by soil that quickly removed any signs of blood. At the same time, it was quite normal to see blood and flesh on the hull back. Tankers got used to it soon. Even when they had to remove fragmented bodies from burnt tanks, tankers kept a stiff upper lip. The Soviet army launched the after Kursk offensive concurrently on several fronts in the second half of July. By 5 August 1943, the Red Army liberated Orel and Belgorod. On the same evening, the first artillery salute was given in Moscow, in honor of the troops involved in the liberation and tankers in particular. In 
1944, T-34 equipped with 76mm gun remained the main Soviet tank. However, from the mid-year, it was substituted by T-34-85. T-34s took part in all large offensive operations of the Red Army that ended with the complete destruction of extensive German forces. The headquarters of tank armies noted that the service life of T-34s was 1.5 to 2 times longer than the warranty period. Their actual working life was up to 350 to 400 machine hours. The 2007 statistical report show that T-34-85 tank is still in service in some countries. In addition to the famous T-34, other armored vehicles were in service in the Red Army. IS-2 heavy tank was the most powerful and the best reinforced, serially produced tanks during the war and one of the top rank tanks in the world. The tank was produced from 1943 till 1953. IS meant Joseph Stalin. Such tanks played a decisive role in battles of 44 and 45 in Europe. The Soviet command managed to gain significant numeric superiority and launched large-scale encirclement operations using tank forces to break through the enemy's defensive positions. The German tank units could hardly respond to the strikes. Often, they left their vehicles and breaking out from the encirclement. Soviet tankers continued performing their hard job. They moved westward, losing their comrades. The hearts of future winners were overwhelmed with grief and sorrow. Grigory Shishkin. Honorable burial were arranged when possible. The fallen were buried in graves and paid last respects. During the battle or retreat, somewhere in the forest or in marshy areas, it was hard to arrange proper burial. Sometimes there was nothing to bury. When Leshka Senyavin tripped a landmine, there were no remains at all. Vasily Bryukov, tank battalion commander. I captured two maps of the second German tank division. The headquarters positions of tank units marked on the map made clear the intentions of German command. I was awarded the order of Suvorov. I was called for awarding to Corps Commander Guvarunenko. I saw him and Shelek, the chief political officer. The Corps Commander enviously said to the chief political officer, Look, Shelig, this Percy boy was awarded the order of Suvorov. The Order of Suvorov was awarded to senior Red Army personnel for exceptional leadership in combat operations, determination, and persistence. The Order of Suvorov was broken down into three different classes, first class, second class, and third class, with the first class as the highest degree. The Order of Suvorov was the highest award to Army commanders. It was awarded to senior personnel only starting from battalion commanders, while the first class order was awarded to army or front commanders only. The first class order was awarded 391 times, included one command and two military training units. The second class order was awarded 2,863 times, including 676 to the Red Army commands and units. The third class order was awarded 4,012 times, including 849 to the Red Army commands and units. The 
front was moving westward, the strategic initiative was finally and forever taken by the Red Army. The failure of Operation Citadel actually meant a defeat. The initiative passed to the Soviet forces. Therefore, Operation Citadel became a determinative and turning point in the war on the Eastern Front. Field Marshal von Manstein bitterly noted. Now the German command had to anticipate the actions of our forces and to recover front lines broken through by the Soviet tank armies that remained the main offensive force of the Soviet army, starting from the Battle of Kursk and up to the end of the Great War.